For me, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank you for giving us your time. Thank you so much for inviting me, Abby. I appreciate it. I want to get right into it. So, human resources, human capital. There is sometimes a bit of a fine line between people not understanding the difference here. How would you say human resources interacts with human capital as a function? Okay, so I think a lot of people think human resources is an archaic way of referring to human capital. Some people call it talent management, talent capital now. But resource is something that you use and sort of ends. Whilst capital is something that you invest in and it, it gives you some, some, some dividends and some Absolutely. outcome. So by repositioning it, a resource, we can say we've outsourced so we've got a human resource it's sorted whilst human capital is something that you nurture you invest in you make sure that it's with you for a long time so it's all about how do we attract that sort of talent how do we uh, maintain that sort of talent and how do we make sure we leverage them for everything they've got for their productivity and for us hitting our marks as organizations now that's a very key word productivity let's think about human capital moving in that line how are African companies and talent management companies tapping into that as an intangible asset? So I think if we start looking at where the rest of the world is, right? Mm. I think in Africa we're a little bit slow. I think some companies in certain parts of the continent are starting to wake up and say, wait a minute, we're not interested in you clocking from eight to, to five or mm. nine to six. We're more interested in what are your outcomes and are you hitting your target? Mm. I think we're all feeling the economic crunch. Uh, we're tightening our belts across the continent. So even our ability to actually leverage uh, our talent is now press pressurized to outcomes based. But yet we still insist on having people walk in at a certain time and clock out at a certain time and say, well, you did your hours, but are your hours sufficing? And over and above that, how are we starting to prepare ourselves as Africans to compete with the rest of the world? Now, that's a very important point. So competition, which is something that we always have to think about when we're looking at. Do you believe that African companies are globally competitive in terms of talent sourcing at this point? And what do we maybe need to tweak to get that if we're not there? I think we have to look, I have to re, I personally think we have to relook at our entire philosophy when it comes to human engagements as Africans. The first is, how do we start getting our employees and our talent to be invested in our organizations? That way we, we are showing a long-term sustainability as opposed to people coming in and then pulling out once they've gotten the resources that they needed from the organization. Yeah. How do we start uh, adopting the partnership model? We see the likes of Google, Facebook, um, really even Virgin, completely saying, listen, we don't care about sick days anymore. We don't care about um, you taking time off. All we care about is productivity. We, they're starting to look at, at, the, at the talent really as holistic people as opposed to a resource that I can just milk. Mm -hmm. So that's the first challenge we've got in Africa. The second challenge we've got is I don't think we're equipping our, um, our talent to solve African problems. Mm -hmm. I think we still at the back end really receiving and being our, our typical consumerism mm -hmm. philosophy, even when it comes to the workplace, as opposed to saying, wait, there's a little bit of genius here. How mm -hmm. can we disrupt the market? How can we bring something that's global? For me, that's very interesting. You touched on something which has got my mind <laughs> <laughs> racing a little bit, and that is the function of how do we immerse local solutions for global thinking. Mm -hmm. And, and how, where are we on that? Do you believe that African companies are, are thinking that far in terms of leapfrogging? I can't talk about that without talking about education. Mm -hmm. So education forms a very fundamental part of grooming people for that. What are your thoughts on using education for African solutions, but with a global competitive edge? That's always an interesting one for me. Mm. So uh, don't get me wrong, I yeah. love education. I've got my master's degree, I'm yeah. busy doing my doctorate. So I'm a big believer in what education can do. Mm. But I think the philosophy of education has to change now. Um, when we went to school, it was all about the industrial revolution. So mm. how do I teach someone to regurgitate what I've just taught them? I don't need you to think, I don't need you to disrupt. Just do as I do and do as I say. Mm. Um, that's no longer functional in the work in the workspace that's now. That's regurgitative thinking. It does not work at all. We have to think outside of the box. So when we're saying education, for me it's no longer, okay, just primary school, secondary school, go to tertiary, mm. you're done. We now have access to information more than before. So what used to be a value advantage mm. of education has to shift in thinking. So if we take a look at the likes of the World Economic Forum, what are the future skills that are required? And they talk about things like critical thinking. So how are we educating in a manner that drives critical thinking. The second requirement is creativity. Before, I remember saying to my mother, I want to be an actress, and she laughed in my face and very quickly uh, expected me to become a chartered accountant. Mm -hmm. Now you're thinking, mm, I might want my child to do a degree in fine arts because it will allow their creativity and disrupt the way of thinking that they could come up with a solution that currently doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So that's the second. The third is communication. 
If we start looking at traditional classrooms, if you need to ask a question, you put up your hand. It's that free flow conversational style thinking. So it means even our current setup in the educational space doesn't drive the needs that we yeah. need in, in, in the future. And the fourth is community, right. which is very, very interesting. We, the West is really now starting to look at Africans saying, and Asians saying, how are you creating the sense of community where you know if you're looking for a solution, it's, it's, it's group and swarm thinking. While swarm thinking says, listen, this get everybody's contribution, um, and the more we can get that, the the more concise our solution can be, the more impactful it can actually be. So, are you saying that our systems are currently very monolithic and rigid, as opposed to free flowing, opening rooms for critical thinking, starting from the classroom itself? Definitely, there's something wrong there. Right. So now, for me, you of course have worked with multinationals. You you've got a very robust experience across not just Africa and beyond. How do African companies think comparatively with global markets? And and what what would you say that the gap is? We've we've identified education, communication, a few gaps in terms of fluidity. But let's look at structures now. What do you think the Western markets are doing differently that we could adapt? I'll use the example of when I worked in uh, Düsseldorf, Germany, for Vodafone. Mm. They had access to thousands of individuals who gave them intellectual capital, but they do not expect them to walk into work. So how do we leverage resources whilst decreasing our actual costs? That's the first question for me. The second question for me, how can a country that has no natural resources say, let's become effective and then we're going to focus on in the servicing industry. I think if we're looking at ourselves specifically, we're still trying to find our feet. We're still talking Agenda 2020. Mm -hmm. That's next year. Mm -hmm. Then everyone's like, okay, wait, Agenda 2030. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're playing catch up as opposed to driving the economy. Mm -hmm. And it certainly doesn't work when we start looking at human capital. So we need to start becoming effective drivers of where we want to be as right. opposed to just the consumers of it and going along for the ride. Well, that's, that's very refreshing to hear. I want to talk about your work mm -hmm. with Hissed Consultant. How is your company positioning itself to address these challenges for the future of work on the continent? So our entire philosophy has been to be pan-African, right? So what we're trying to do at Hasid Consulting is saying, okay, so we've got presence in Nigeria. There's certain elements that in human capital and in training that Nigeria is doing very, very effectively that people in Rwanda and Uganda don't have access to. So it's almost becoming a best uh, sharing platform across. And we specifically focus on our on our multinational corporates. Um, the way you say, okay, you guys have this all this human capital across, but they're not talking to each other. So it's, it's interesting to see how can we help support you from a coaching and consulting perspective to make sure that your middle manager your executives are brought up to par so they are at a national level some of the best mm -hmm. then okay let's take a look at pan-african some of the best and then we rely a lot of our research from out of our new york office mm -hmm. to say what are the trends globally what is the west doing what is asia doing that we can now infuse in our offering i want to sort of hop on this part of pan-african standards let's yeah. put it that way how do we ensure that we stay true to what is tailored for this market i'm going to bring it down to even just africa mm. so what would be relevant for um, somebody who works in in kenya might not be useful for me here in Lagos depending mm. on our sector specific roles how are you making sure that that you're able to measure output the, our biggest challenge is really that quantitative. So what we do try to do is partner a lot with local organizations mm. to get a clear understanding of what the local market needs so we don't come across as presumptuous. Mm. So you just have to be very, very wary of saying, I actually don't know. This is what I do know. What is relevant here? How can we partner? Um, but in the qualitative, it's, it's really a challenge. For us, our biggest key measures are staff turnover. It's really an increase in productivity. And it's really an increase in how many new fresh ideas have you, are you now seeing? What should be a basic point in terms mm. of nurturing the market? What are we lacking? So I think it, as an organization, the first step is understanding in, internally, one, what your culture is, because I think that's mm. a big challenge. You know, we always say that culture eats strategy for breakfast. What is your culture and what do your people look for? And is our culture aligned to our goals? The second is an understanding of how the market perceives you. Right. We're in the space where the millennials, the centennials are all coming in and the trend across the world is, I'm not interested in working for a big firm. I'm interested for working for a firm that has an impact, that's going to leave a legacy, that makes me feel like an entrepreneur within the yes. organization. So are you actually attractive to your market, to your future employees? And like we walk into work, we clock in, good afternoon, good afternoon. You don't really see the person next yeah. to you. You have no idea of their context, what their challenges are, what do they actually need, what, what brings them to work. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know their why, 
However, will you fulfill their purpose within the organization? Okay, this is a very interesting point because I'm thinking of something else right now. We're in the age of machine learning. So, of course, there are the feelings that is this going to replace the human um, aspect of work as we go. What are your thoughts on this age that we're approaching, that we actually are in right now? What's the future of work when we're thinking about technological trends? I think a lot of um, employees have to really think about what is the value that you actually bring to work. Mm. If the value that you bring to work is, oh, here's the report done, then you are in big trouble, my friend. Mm. But if the value that you bring to your organization is, wait a minute, why? Why are we doing it that way? Can we not try something new? Then the value you bring is beyond what artificial intelligence or machine learning can bring to the table because you're asking the important questions. I think we're in the age now where it's no longer about the answers, it's about the questions. Sure. And I think the moment we, we really delve into our curiosity and we take responsibility for our own personal learning and development and the quality of conversation that we can bring to the table at work, our value fundamentally increases. So connection, collaboration, communication, very key points. For me, I want to thank you so much for your time. This has been a very um, exciting conversation and I wish you um, very best of luck with the rest of your work. Um, we're looking forward to seeing what more comes forward from your company and of course engage on more um, human human resources and human capital future for Africa. Thank you so much for having Thank me, you. I really appreciate it. Thanks this. so much.